So let me introduce Suzanne. She is our guest speaker for tonight's program. She received her PhD. I'm going to read this because otherwise I don't want to make a mistake here. She received her PhD in biomedical sciences at UCSF, where she studied how proteins misfiled. It says misfiled, misfolded. They misfold um, in neurogenitive diseases. Now she's at the Buck Institute for Research in Marin on aging. Uh, and uh, Suzanne, Suzanne uses uh, uh, the microscopic nematode C. elegans, uh, which uh, you'll be able to see in our exhibits here as well. And she uses that to understand how metals can impact the Parkinson's disease state and how mitochondria respond to stress and aging. So let me introduce Suzanne. <coughs> Hello, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Suzanne, I'm a researcher at the Buck Institute. Uh, it's in Novato. Um, we have tours and you're welcome to come and visit if you're ever up there. And so today I'm gonna talk about trying to understand the relationship between manganese and Parkinsonism um, and also a little bit about Parkinson's disease um, and my work using the nearly microscopic nematode C. elegans. So there are many sources of environmental manganese, some Ron already discussed. Um, probably the most common um, a source of manganese in, in the high abundance are fungicides, which are on crops and farmland. And uh, there's um, a fungicide called Maneb that has complexed with manganese. And that can um, actually increase, there's evidence that that increases the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Uh, in the past, gasoline has also been added um, to manganese, and as Maron said, it's no longer added, but that at some point that did add um, ambient, higher levels of ambient manganese in the air. Steel factories, the ambient environment around steel factories might have um, higher um, manganese air particles. And so these are, you know, these are ways to get manganese that are not from nutrition, uh, but, you know, sort of a more of a pollutant uh, stand. And I've highlighted a few studies then that have shown um, correlations then between being exposed to these factors and increasing the risk of Parkinson's disease. And I should say though that these are not, right now these are correlative uh, studies, they're not cause and effect. Um, epidemiological studies are notoriously hard to pin down cause and effect. And there are epidemiological studies that actually show no relationship between manganese and Parkinson's. So this is controversial and it's debatable, but I think one reason researchers were interested in studying, further studying the role of manganese in uh, Parkinson's was because there is this syndrome uh, called manganism that uh, Ron already alluded to. And this occurs um, when people are exposed to very, very high levels of manganese. So this would really be an occupational um, type situation. So miners and welders, um, they basically can get manganese toxicity, and the symptoms of manganese toxicity are very similar to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So that has led to a lot of researchers became interested in trying to understand that relationship more in depth. So here is a study from 1955 that showed, um, described manganese poisoning in Moroccan miners. And they actually cite how um, manganism was actually first described all the way back in 1837. And um, this uh, five manganese ore crushers um, developed manganism. And these Moroccan miners also developed manganism. And these, the symptoms of manganism include muscular weakness, um, paraplegia, um, tremors of the extremities, and a tendency to lean forward. And these are also all symptoms that occur in Parkinson's disease. So here is actually a photograph of a uh, uh, Moroccan miner that had been, been afflicted with manganism, and you can see that he has difficulty um, walking. And 
um, here, even as of um, this year, there are still uh, cases of people that have been exposed to high levels of manganese and develop a Parkinson-like syndrome, um, which we call Parkinsonism. And so in the top case, um, it shows welders um, that were exposed to manganese have a Parkinsonism. And, uh, oh, sorry about that. And uh, in the bottom case is actually illicit drug users that have used, uh, were using this drug, um, ephedrine, and that was laced with manganese. And so these uh, drug users also develop a manganese-induced um, Parkinsonism. So why are manganism and why do manganism and PD have similar symptoms? It's because they both affect the same regions of the brain. So I'm showing you a cross section, um, or sorry, a frontal section of the brain, and I've highlighted in blue um, the regions of the brain that are most affected in Parkinson's disease and manganism, and that is the basal ganglia. And um, the basal ganglia is composed um, of the striatum, the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra, and a few other loci that I haven't mentioned. And the basal ganglia naturally is a natural reservoir for um, manganese. So it naturally has high levels of manganese because manganese is involved in many enzymatic reactions, important in the brain, and it tends to be high in the basal ganglia. So what happens with manganism is that it's thought to preferentially ac accumulate when you have high uh, levels of manganese in the basal ganglia. Um, and in particular, the globus pallidus is primarily affected in manganism. Um, however, in Parkinson's disease, the substantia nigra, and in particular, the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra are affected in Parkinson's disease. So the basal ganglia is responsible largely for voluntary movement, but other things too. Um, and so they're well connected, um, but they have similar, so manganism and PD have similar overlapping, but distinct um, motor symptoms that um, experienced clinicians can then actually um, discern the differences. Um, but to the non-discerning eye, the motor symptoms between manganism and PD appear similar. So the other thing that manganism and PD have in common are that they both afflict um, mitochondria. So mitochondria are organelles. If we sort of zoom then into the cellular level, um, mitochondria are organelles that are responsible for energy production in the cells. And so you can imagine that energy production is actually really vital for survival of the cells. If the mitochondria become dysfunctional, they often induce something called apoptosis, which directs the cell to self-destruct. And because you have just, um, if you have a dysfunctional, you know, energy producing organelle, you don't necessarily want to survive. And so that is then one of the major symptoms uh, in PD and manganism is neurodegeneration of uh, vulnerable neurons. So to talk a little bit then more about the relationship between manganese and PD, as I said, this is still controversial exactly um, if manganese is a causal effect, uh, a risk factor for PD, but there's some clues that metal dysfunction is in, um, important in PD patients. So PD patients have abnormal levels of circulating metals in their uh, blood, including elevated manganese in their serum. Um, PD mutations, um, so there are forms of Parkinson's um, that actually uh, are familial or inherited, and this um, is actually a very small percentage of all the uh, PD cases. Most PD cases are thought to be sporadic. We don't know the, the um, cause, but there are a few subset of um, inherited uh, mutations, and these genes that have been identified in the last couple of decades in these familial forms of Parkinson's disease have really um, uh, uh, led to the progression of our understanding of the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So for example then, one of the genes that have been, has been identified in these familial forms of Parkinson's is known to be a transporter for iron and manganese. And so 
if we look uh, some more at the subcell subcellular level, we see that this mutation can actually then increase the suscept susceptibility to manganese toxicity, and this is in a s research uh, lab setting. Um, Park uh, Parkinson's disease is also um, has some differences from manganism, and the main difference um, from um, manganism is that PD is marked also marked by protein aggregation. And PD, not just PD, but many age-dependent neurodegenerative diseases are marked by protein aggregation. So Alzheimer's disease, um, Huntington's disease, ALS, all have these protein aggregates um, in the brain and body. And I just want to sh show you a very simple demonstration of what I mean so you can get a good understanding of when I, when I say protein aggregation. So if you just imagine this cup is a protein. So it has a very distinct form, um, and it also has a very distinct function to carry a beverage. Um, and what happens in pr with protein aggregation is essentially the protein completely loses its form and thus loses its function. And it then can you clumps, so it will clump to itself, and it can also um, clump to organelles in the cell, and it can, you can then imagine how then that could really wreak havoc inside of a cell. So protein aggregation is another um, hallmark of PD. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit then about C. elegans. So C. elegans are nearly microscopic. They're about a millimeter uh, in size, and I've actually brought a blown up version of the worm. So if you all want to take a look more closely at the worm, you can come up after. So they're a great model to use for many reasons. Um, so Parkinson's disease is a, mar a multifactorial disease, uh, meaning that many factors uh, contribute to its onset. Aging, um, oh my, did it again, sorry. Uh, aging uh, is actually one of the biggest risk factors for Parkinson's disease. And at the Buck Institute, we are primarily interested in studying the aging process and that, how that contributes to disease onset. Genetics, um, it, as I've already mentioned, um, uh, can play a role in Parkinson's disease, but it actually, of all the Parkinson's disease cases, it uh, only about 5% are familial or inherited. So it's actually genetics, we believe right now, pl is play, plays a small part in, in Parkinson's disease. So again, environment is, as I've been talking about, manganese is a large um, risk factor. Um, but really then, it's a combination of all these things together or working together that eventually lead to disease onset. And to try to study all this can be very challenging when you have so many um, different factors. So C. elegans helps make that a little easier because one, they're a really great aging model. Um, they only live about two weeks. And a lot of the stuff that we know about aging actually was first discovered in C. elegans. The, we know so much about them genetically. The whole genome has been sequenced, and we have many genetic tools to um, be able to dissect um, all the genes in C. elegans, and they're environmentally malleable. So they live on a plate like this that we look under the microscope, and so I can manipulate their environment very easily. I can add manganese to the plate um, if I'm studying heat or heat stress, I can put them in heat. So their C. elegans then can really um, take care of all these multifactorial factors um, to help study disease. So uh, some of the questions I wanted to ask um, was, can manganese toxicity recapitulate Parkinson-like syndromes, um, pathologies in the worm? And can we identify novel small molecules then that could ameliorate manganese toxicity and eventually see if those are uh, beneficial in Parkinson's models? So here, um, oh, and I should mention that the Exploratorium does have C. elegans here too in two exhibits um, that way. Um, so if you 
uh, so the C. elegans contain a complete um, but simplified nervous system. So here I'm showing you uh, a worm um, that has, this is the head, this is the tail, and these are all their neurons that have been labeled with a fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein. And the worms are transparent, so that makes it very easy then to just look under the microscope and see these worms fluoresce, and you can look at their neurons. So humans have, um, I believe around 400,000 dopaminergic neurons. Those are the neurons involved in Parkinson's disease that degenerate with Parkinson's disease. C. elegans only have eight. So we can look at those eight neurons and see what's happening. Uh, it makes things a lot simpler, um, simpler. So we know that manganese and manganese containing fungicides that I mentioned um, earlier can induce neurodegeneration in the worm. So here we're looking at the, specifically looking at the dopaminergic neurons of the worm that have been labeled with GFP and at in with increasing concentrations of manganese, you can see that there's a thinning of the fluorescence um, marker and at some point, there's even complete loss of these dendrites. So these are the round parts or the cell bodies, and the long structures are the dendrites. So manganese can induce dopaminergic degeneration in the worms. We also know that uh, manganese is toxic to the worms at high doses. Uh, again, so at low doses, we don't necessarily see any toxicity, but at high doses, uh, we do. So this is a survival curve, which uh, is very common um, when you're working with C. elegans. Uh, on the x-axis is the survive, how many uh, worms are alive. Uh, on the y-axis is how old they are, how many days they are living. So all the worms are dead around 28 days. Uh, and um, WT wild type, those are the controlled worms in the gray. And when you treat those worms with manganese in the red, you can see that they live shorter. So it shortens their lifespan. So since I mentioned that one of the um, major pathologies from manganese and NPD is mitochondrial dysfunction. I wanted to see if I could recapitulate mitochondrial dysfunction in the worms. Again, you can use this um, green fluorescent protein. Um, it's a neat system. So in this uh, system, you have your GFP uh, fluorescent protein uh, tagged to another protein that normally becomes elevated if there's mitochondrial stress. So each line here represent is a single worm. So when I add manganese to these worms, I see that they turn bright green, indicating then that there is mitochondrial stress occurring. Um, and normally in the con control worms, they have very low levels of mitochondrial stress. So manganese is able to recapitulate uh, the stress response. Uh, protein aggregates, as I've already mentioned and demonstrated um, to you, protein aggregation is a, a big a pathological hallmark in PD. So you can introduce um, proteins that are, uh, have a propensity to misfold directly into the worm and again tag them with a green fluorescent protein. And here are individual worms and each of them um, each of these green puncta then represents a protein aggregate, uh, a protein that is becoming aggregated in the worms. And so I wanted to see what the effect of manganese was on these protein aggregates. So protein, um, manganese exacerbates protein aggregate toxicity. So let me take you through this slide. Um, it's a little data heavy. So here um, are our control worms. And these are just a bright field of the same worms. And in this um, central panel is another control. Um, it's a choline chloride, which should have no biological activity um, in the worm. So it really serves as a control for this um, chlorine ion, which I wanted was because we have manganese is attached to chlorine here. So manganese chloride, then these worms were treated with manganese chloride in this panel. And if you look at the survival of these worms, so if these worms are treated with manganese for 24 hours, which really is not that long, it's a pretty short um, uh, inoculation, 
you can see that there's a dramatic decrease in their survival after 24 hours and only the manganese treated. So manganese is really exacerbating that protein aggregate um, toxicity. So since C. elegans, I've been able to recapitulate a few of these um, key pathological hallmarks, mitochondrial dysfunction, protein aggregation um, dysfunction. One of the things um, I was interested in doing was look screening for small molecules then that could potentially reverse or ameliorate the um, toxicity of manganese. And um, I used the stress reporter uh, that I mentioned before um, that lights up when, there's m when manganese is present, there's mitochondrial dysfunction. So here is an example of the experimental setup. Uh, have a 96 well plate uh, and in each one of these um, wells there uh, are a drug a, a different drug compound and you can add the worms directly to the wells and then add manganese and most of the worms then will light up but what I was looking was to see if I could find any compounds that actually inhibited um, the the stress response so that the worms remained and uh, looked like controls. So I'm gonna just then, to close, briefly talk about uh, one candidate compound that I've been looking at that did seem to potently inhibit this uh, manganese stress response. So using this candidate um, small molecule, I found that the the small molecule was able to completely reverse or inhibit the toxicity of manganese that we saw with the survival. So here, it, in the presence of the manganese stress inhibitor, um, the worms now live as long as the control worms, uh, even though there's manganese present. So it's, it's abolishing the toxicity. And then um, I wanted to then move the small molecule into a non-manganese model, but into a Parkinson model, and see if there was any effect of this model, of this a molecule, in other models of disease. So in this panel, what I'm showing you are the worms in which the dopaminergic neurons have been labeled, and this worm is also expressing a protein that is toxic and that's associated with Parkinson's disease in the neurons so that the neurons actually die from this um, protein aggregates. And what I see is that in the presence of that manganese stress inhibitor, we're able to recover the survival of some of these neurons. So normally you see neurons on both sides. Uh, this is in the head of the worm. These are the cell bodies. And the controls, you see many that have lost neurons, but the manganese stress inhibitor is able to um, uh, repress some of that neurodegeneration in the worm. Also, if I look at the mitochondria of the worms, so in these two panels, what I'm showing you are worms that have been aged and that the mitochondria now are being labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein. So here the neurons were labeled, but here the mitochondria are labeled. And in old worms, the mitochondria becomes large um, and sort of disfigured with age. Um, but with the manganese stress inhibitor, um, the mitochondria stay reticular and tubular, which is much more reminiscent of younger worms. So it seems that then this candidate molecule is having beneficial effects on Parkinson models and also on the aging and mitochondrial stress. So I'm very focused right now on the C. elegans aspect of working, trying to work out the mechanism of the molecule, that uh, the small molecule, but at the buck, and uh, we do try to use the C. elegans eventually to translate our work into mammals, and the buck is actually a really good place for that because there's many labs that work in cell culture or um, with uh, larger, with vertebrate uh, animals, so we can collaborate and, and try to see if, you know, the things that we're finding in C. elegans are relevant in mammals. And we have, 
good reason to believe that they are because, as I said, a lot of the things that we've learned about aging um, have come from C. elegans. There's a lot of conservation, so um, it's kind of a way to start fast and cheap with the C. elegans and then use that data to move uh, into um, the bigger uh, and harder experiments. So uh, I will end there. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll take um, any questions.